resolve is far greater. Black-hearted and savage. Hello there, I am Gareth Coop and we are going to look at the top strategy and real-time strategy games available on Game Pass. Now this one's quite complicated because not all of them are available on Xbox console, but all of these are available on PC. I'll try and stipulate what isn't available on console because it's mouse and keyboard stuff towards the end, so I can only apologise. I'm also trying to avoid any duplications. I did a turn-based list and an RTS list, which was really Steam-focused. It went crazy. Hop over and have a look at that if you haven't already. Wastelanders 2 Director's Cut is a crowdfunded sequel to its original that came out in 1988. Alright, Fallout 1 came out in 1997. A film called Hardware came out in 1990, directed by a chap called Richard Stanley, who I think may have played this game for some inspiration. It's very much turn-based. It's very much a, was a Windows exclusive. Now it's available on Game Pass. Now I finally get to try what is critically quite an important game. It's important because it's one of the heaviest paper and pen based RPG influence games I've played recently. It is so dependent on your team choice and stats and leveling that it is almost tabletop like when it comes to importance of equipment and team composition. It's tough. It's very tough from the get-go. The enemy variation is huge. Your blights and special moves and increased maneuverability coming out of everywhere. The game keeps you guessing and hunting for loot and cool equipment to help keep you alive. It's very water focused as well. You saw that travel screen. I have to be regularly topped up. It is important. There's quite a lot of resource management here. I do hold it in quite high regard in regards to the hierarchy of top turn-based games that are available on the modern systems. This is very good. It's got that retro feel, but again, falls on cool ease of life and new RPG techniques, all pushed into this lovely remade package. So it's a great little game and you should be looking at it if you have access to Game Pass and are remotely interested in turn-based strategy. As yesterday, we were turning the wheels of progress until the frost stopped it all. Okay, Frostpunk is available on console and PC. Now, this one I gave a really hard time when I made a list about the top games to play in isolation. This one got plucked out for the PlayStation 4 and way back then it was really new and I really grab hold of strategy games or RTS games on console because I like the idea. I know it's annoying with the pad but this one's got a very simplified almost sort of circular control scheme because you are rotating around the center of your city which is this massive fire. Yeah you are keeping everyone alive in the most freezing apocalypse possible and everybody is dying or complaining this is one of those games that involves moral decision making at critical stages and people dying because you haven't been paying attention. That's the toughest game loop for me possible when it comes to real time strategy. And that's what got me annoyed when I first looked at it. I wasn't aware that it was a game purely about population and city building. I thought there might be another village nearby that sends troops over, or there might be rabid ice wolves that attack your workers every so often. There is no combat. So bear that in mind, but there are games out there that do rely on this sort of loop, and they're really good and very popular. It's just not my cup of tea. Think The Sims in one of those massive freezers. You know, like the horizontal ones that look like coffins. And sort of cut an eyepiece hole in the lid of it. And then every time you want to see something, you just rotate yourself around the fridge. The control scheme's not that bad. And I do love the little trails they leave in the snow and how detailed these small little people are. When you see them die and you haven't built a cemetery, they're just literally bodies on the street. It's a tough one, morally.
But going back to it with my expectations set firm that there weren't going to be any giant steampunk tanks in it, I embraced it a bit more and felt the message more clearly about what this game is trying to achieve. It is atmospheric, it is really cool, it's super depressing and you have to make really important decisions at critical points in the game. It's a survival winter horror based in a city, in a fridge that's shaped like a coffin. We humbly accept the emergency powers the Senate has bestowed upon us. Okay, slightly embarrassing declaration here. Stellaris is available on Game Pass and it's something I had my eye on for a really, really long time because it's an RTS that's very famous in the industry. It's huge, it's intergalactic, interstellar. It's all about battles, resource management, jumping around planets, taking over stuff, terraforming, being a general badass. But the majority of the screens look like this. Not the most white knuckle footage, and it annoys me that I can't express the depth of this game through three minutes of capture. You are looking at a lot of screens, you are looking at a lot of drop downs, but it's scope to pan out in this game to quite literally scroll back that mouse wheel and to see that galaxy size and to realize the potential you have it within this world will make your knees buckle. It's crazy huge. It's completely about diplomacy, intergalactic relations, befriending the right races, and going to war with the wrong ones will turn your game into a nightmare. It's very clever with how far you're going to stretch yourself, where you're going to direct your resources. There's an awful lot going on behind the scenes, but this interface kind of hides the panic. It's clever, and there's a lot of moving parts with this. Stellaris is a must visit if you're remotely interested in real-time strategy or sort of galactic space, even discovery. Terraforming new planets, discovering new alien races is totally epic, but I just Apologise for the lack of exciting so, footage. Hence the trailers, GameRex. Can of hope. They alone seem to stand between us and utter oblivion. Exciting footage, you say? Star Renegades will sort you out. Love this. Final Fantasy Tactics meets a retro roguelike. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's a total splice. And hell, is it fun. Ridiculously hard, too hard, way too hard. It's gonna last me years, this game. Then again, I can't even do the return of first boss, so I've gone down a peg or two. But reaction speed has got nothing to do with this game. This is all about choosing the right class, powering up the right people, using your loot in the correct way, and just surviving through the Nemesis system, which blatantly is stole from Shadow of Mordor. Actually, loads of games have pinched that system. It's a really great idea. What it kind of means is that it's a jostling of the bosses that you might fight, or a hierarchy of bosses that are themselves intermingling and changing out, so you never quite know who you've got to fight. Or they might even have their own rivalries, so you end up with someone completely different on a different playthrough. The progression system is actually quite well pitched. Opening new characters, the more you play, there is an incentive to pick up that controller again. How smart. Ah, oh, the old Iron Harvest, I see, yeah. Important, because this is what I call a linchpin game or a pivot game. This is the reason I put the whole list together. Even though it's not number one, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and made me think, right, let's get it all together, because this one needs to be pegged where it stands with a lot of the RTS games out. I'm gutted I didn't put it on that original list, because it is over on Steam and has been available on PC for a long time. But now we get to try it for like six quid a month or whatever it is, and hell, I'm down for that. But here's the thing, it panned on release, it completely belly flopped and everyone was like, by the way, those dissipation mechanics? I'm a big fan of dissipation mechanics and that, this, that's the best on the list. But again, reminder, this is the newest RTS on the list. Anyway, back to the point, 
it's had a lot of time to get itself sorted out. Apparently the balance issues were all over the shop. One of the races was blatantly better than the other. The multiplayer didn't work because of that and the AI could just be cheesed to hell. I've had three solid days with it and my first impressions get this when I fired it up. None of the camera panning or zoom keys worked and none of the pegging of those keys worked and I was like, this is screwed. I can't, I can't play an RTS unless I've got complete freedom of camera. It's to do with the capture and it just feels a lot more natural being able to swing around and catch stuff out, especially on a symmetric battlefield like this. So I was like, oh no, but it was a glitch. It then just started working. The campaign is not <laughs> worth it. Not the one with the ginger kid and the snowballs anyway. That I was nearly fell out. The voice acting in some of it is pretty shocking. But what you'll see in is what you get in the skirmish. I love the skirmish, hands down, love it. Using these massive mechs, there's another thing. The steampunk, diesel punk mechs. And the artist is the guy from Scythe who did the board game. It's beautiful pastel artwork combined with that brutal mechanical nature duality that there always seems to be predominant in his work. The noise and the mech design and the universe it's in and the accents and the terrain, that beautiful winter. It's a game that should be looked at now. It doesn't compete with the big boys. It's not a StarCraft 2. Do not think that this is the new RTS to be playing, but those updates and improvements, its graphical fidelity is definitely worth looking at. I had finally found peace until Emergence Day. So we're midway on the list. Time for a coffee break, I think, and a think back to XCOM and XCOM 2. And the original list that I made. Some of those turn-based games, Divinity Original Sin, Mechanicus, are so strong. And when turn-based games get it right, they can be so rewarding. Gears of War Tactics is very rewarding and they've got an awful lot right. All right, let's move. You got a name, soldier? They've nailed that squad ownership and management thing that XCOM was so good at. Not naming your characters and seeing them die and quite literally bursting into tears on the spot, but being able to develop them and put attachments onto their rifles, give them strengths in the directions that you're using, and gradually craft a team that are genuinely made from the ground up by yourself. It's also really exciting when you click that end turn button, you'd sit in there biting your nails and the stuff that goes on, the way the Overwatch clicks in instantly and the cool noises all the Locust guys make, it comes together and quite cool edge of the seat stuff and the missions are not easy. The female character has quite a cool invisibility action that enables her to get around the back of the enemy. And everyone's got about five action points, four action points, and it's very clear on what you can and can't do within that scope. You can have loads of fun developing moves or pulling off flanking maneuvers or just grenading a single group of, and just seeing the whole lot go up in one turn. Epic game. Talking of epic games, and these cutscenes on Halo Wars 2 knock me on my ass. Love them to bits. And I love Halo Wars 2, so here's the story. You can't, you couldn't get to Halo Wars 2 unless you owned a high end Xbox for ages. Then it got put onto the whole Windows 10 thing, and again, you needed a decent PC or half decent PC to run it. So it's been out of my grasp up until I got the Game Pass, and it was one of that and Gears 5. Halo Wars 2, they were the things I went straight to, and man, it paid off.
It is such a great tribute to the series. Did you see the Spartan going into that tank and put the grenade in and took it over and now it's on my team? Tiny little details. The environments on the maps are a massive payoff to loads of cool stuff in the Halo series. Everything is here. All the races have got their coolest machinery firing on all cylinders at each other. It's crazy the panic that can go on. I've been forgetting to mention that most of the real-time strategy games so far we've seen on this list have used what's called a control point system where you take over a point on the map or a number of points on the map to increase the score that is switching from side to side depending on who's got the most nodes or control points. Again, not explained very well, but that is a system that this game uses brilliantly. And of course, it's a system that some of the top games came up with in the first place, but here it's utilized so well well with those installation points, the multi-tiered firing mechanic from height, the maps really take advantage of it. It uses a sort of Dawn of War 2 base system where you don't really have to worry too much about base positioning but you still have to worry about base security so you can still put turrets in but everything's got like a mapped out section where you put things down so you can crack straight on with troop management, platoon management and vehicles and flying vehicles. There's loads of flying vehicles in this game. It does not hold back with vehicle variation type. Hero units, there's loads of them and you can put all of these different things on them and just make them into a one man battlefield. Halo Wars 2 sits proudly in my top echelon of RTS games of all time. Can you believe that? And the controller mapping is flawless. One of the few games on this list I would happily play on controller as well. What the hell, Koo? Is this Bible game? You're putting Bible games on your list? It's Age of Empires 2. Kudos to me for not putting Age of Empires 3 on there. Age of Empires 1. <laughs> do have fond memories of it, but I actually never played this at length, so this was great to get back into. The music, the funny little voice samples, Hold'em, Chopper, you know the deal. Ready, yay, yes. From the outside, Age of Empires looks like one of these games that history teachers try and get you to play, to try and dupe you into learning something. And like the Assassin's Creed series, you do actually have quite a historic wealth of information in here. And it is awesome to try and pick a different race or to have like the Aztecs fighting the Vikings and stuff. The hilarities you can get going on with wrong timelines are beautiful, but it is a cracking RTS, let's be fair. Everybody's got fond memories of this and it is still just as good. And it is available on Game Pass. As you can see, I'm really bad at it, but I just see a bottomless pit of fun trying out the skirmish mode, trying out all of the races, all of the cool maps, making it through all your feudal ages to try and rank up all your armor and weaponry, making the crossover to crossbows and fighting like random killer boars on the map. I didn't realize that they were as dangerous as they were. It's amazing. I think there's a new one on the horizon and let me know in the comments do we have a Dawn of War 3 situation with this series where this second one is blatantly better than the newest one let me know because there's something brand new coming up on the horizon the same with Total War we've got Total War 3 coming as well so the whole thing's just going to go mental this year the Age of Empires campaign is actually not bad and I do have and will be looking at it because the skirmish does have its nuances but I kind of can see the ceiling on it already so I'm going to look into that story based content and I might even look at the multiplayer because that's just going to be Amazing. Batal. Ready. Yes. So Age of Empires 2 available on Game Pass right now, not available on console as far as I know, unfortunately. But you're gonna need a keyboard and mouse for this bad boy. Ah. <laughs> 
yeah, we are actually at number two, and Darkest Dungeon is now on Game Pass. I'm not going to dwell on this too long. It's been all over my channel like a bad rash, deservedly so. Another life wasted in the pursuit of glory and gold. Self-preservation is paramount at any cost. Just footage of one of my amazing runs there, where the entire team goes crazy, turns on each other, joins the other team as well at one point, murders each other, refuses to move, jostles out of position, everything went wrong from the get-go. That's the joy of Darkest Dungeon, is the game freaking hates you. It's not all about making friends though and sometimes it's great to have a brilliant challenge and this is hands down the best turn-based indie game out there. It is up there with Slay the Spire for me which was going to be on this list. I think we've only got 9 games but again Slay the Spire gets way too much air time. I want to concentrate on this a little bit more because it's getting old now and it's got some cool DLC apparently Michael. I think I've owned the game for near on three and a half years, can't get past the first quarter, and it does suffer the permadeath system that made us all cry in XCOM 2. Man, this has got a harsh permadeath, and it's got a vending system on new characters coming into your camp, so you won't always get your like, fave dude back, and that can be crushing. Just as crushing as how pear-shaped this whole thing goes immediately after just making one bad decision. It's genius game design, it's beautiful art, and it's got some of the best character systems I've seen in an RPG for a long time. Like, even the healers will sometimes just go to in there. You're having five points, and you're on death's door, and you just need that game to give you some good RNG. It won't do it. <laughs> That's what I love about it. It's like a harsh, mean boss that's great to beat. And I have, have brilliant fun getting to some of the last early bosses, beating them. They're very well done, and they all have unique attack patterns and pull out some crazy move that you just didn't or hadn't dealt with before. Teetering on the brink, facing the abyss. It's also got a brilliant turn in psycho system, which is the white dots you see or squares under each character. Once they reach breaking point, they will break your game and start annoying the hell out of you by refusing to use items, switching positions, which can be detrimental to your entire game plan because each character has an optimal position within your party. Everything can go wrong from one character not playing ball. Darkest Dungeon is one of the best strategy games available on Game Pass. It's number two on my list. Hold on to your seats, peeps. We got number one coming. Company of Heroes 2 bowls in at number one and is available on Game Pass. And whoa, what a Second World War classic we have here. And yes, it is from Relic and it does use all of the best stuff that we saw in the greatest RTS games that came out about 10, 15 years ago. Running this on top setting and having that freedom with all of the sliders was a dream come true for me. It's got a totally epic campaign featuring some of the key moments from the Russian side in the latter stages of the Second World War with Stalingrad and some great voice acting. So that campaign needs to be looked at because it's got some cool cosmetic unlocks that then bleed into the skirmish mode and the skirmish mode is like my go-to thing. I actually bought the British Forces DLC, I did talk about this in the other video, it was hands down the greatest microtransaction I ever bought in my life. The transformation of the meta with the vehicles and different infantry type and the cool homages to all of the British vehicles used in that section of the war. One of my favorite things to do is have the Tank Museum YouTube channel on and be playing this and they'll be talking about the Panzer IV or something and I'll be firing at one at the same time in this game. Life doesn't get much better. They're trying to take it.
It's also got some incredible AI in it that is steeped quite highly. The moderate or medium setting took me a while. I'm now on hard and I've got another echelon to go and I just can't wait to chip away at that huge Nazi wall that's stopping me from finishing the hard mode on the skirmish game. One thing I haven't mentioned is that Iron Harvest and Age of Empires, but that one doesn't matter too much, but Iron Harvest doesn't have a replay mode. As far as I could tell, or as far as I know on patches, there hasn't been one put in yet. That's devastating. Reverse engineering a loss on a real-time strategy game like this is one of my favourite pastimes. Ah, <laughs> uh, I wish that was a joke. This may have been the first time I truly appreciated the control point system as well. Total annihilation or just smashing the enemy's base is a lot of fun, but it can be quite fruitless as a tactic. So I love the idea of taking sections of the map using different machinery and vehicles to hold those points and rush in points with other fast movement. It just gives you a lot more opportunities for a lot more tactical gameplay. And of course, this has got a great cover mechanic in it. We saw that in Iron Harvest. We saw it in a lot of the Dawn of War games. This one's got one of the best with vehicle occupation and dissipation. The destruction mechanic is epic in this game. I think I might have even seen a patch go through for this the other day. It's got an extremely healthy online community still, and it's got a very strong PvP system in it. As you can imagine, all these different unit types, all these different classes of troops, and different factions and country forces just throws up so many different rock, paper, scissor combinations that the PvP is so complicated and awesome to watch and tactical and full of cool key decisions and using the terrain, occupying all the different houses and key points is massive in this setup. And that tank just smashing through the wall. Like This is the AI, so I watch the AI when they beat me or if I beat them, I, I watch as them and, and see the trouble that I cause them. And this tank is proactively looking. my t-34 this thing is extremely dangerous but i pop out of the mist out the old fog of war and disappear well i don't actually i chase it down i don't get the kill extremely annoying That tree getting dragged under its tracks in its panicked reverse. It's an amazing looking game still with some really crazy physics and destruction going on with the brickwork and all the walls. The tanks just don't care, they go through anything and you've got loads of cool dust and explosions and sort of cindered powder flying everywhere. This is a flat cannon, technically an anti-aircraft vehicle, but the AI is using it on my troops. Stuff like this would have actually happened in real life and you know, you only get to realise how unbelievable that war must have been. And games like this pay it with the respect and homage it deserves. As always, guys, I'm going to say goodbye and see you down there. Loads more content coming. Couch co-op, split screen, you name it, we're playing it. <laughs>